Hey guys, welcome back to one of these 2024 maths videos where we go through the hardest questions from the papers. This time we're doing the November series. November tends to be harder, but honestly, I think this one's a little bit on the easy side. Um, I'm also not going through every single question at the end of the paper, just going through 17 and then I think I skip one, then I do the last two because there's one that's just substituting into a function, which I thought would be a bit too trivial. So for those of you that haven't seen a video like this before, again, I'm only going through the hardest questions to kind of give you an idea of how you can get from a grade five, six, seven to a seven, eight or nine. Um, because what tends to happen with a lot of the last questions is the first step, it's very easy to get some marks in them, but some students just don't answer them at all and they get zero out of four or five or whatever. Whereas if you can get those extra marks, even if you're just writing one or two little things, it can boost your grade up by quite a bit because realistically speaking, you're probably gonna be within five marks of going up to the next grade. That's across three papers. So if in all of the last questions you only get one mark, you actually go up a grade, which is really quite nice. But without further ado, let's just jump straight into it with this circle theorems question. So how do I approach a circle theorem question? Well, what I would do is I would start by labeling the information they've given me. So they give us that CD is a tangent, wonderful. Um, you don't have to use that, but you can use that in this question. It says BCD, so BCD, this angle here is 40 degrees. So let's label that. And it says the angle OAB, so OAB, this part of the angle over here, in fact, I might label it as two different colors. That is three times OAC. So I could call it like X and 3X. And they want us to work out the total angle ACD. So they want us to work out, uh, give me another, let's say this one. So because I already have the angle BCD, all I really need to work out is ACB. If I work out ACB, then I'm done. Now, okay, what would I do next? Well, there's two ways to kind of start this. And the reason why I'm saying two ways is because you can either work backwards from the end or work forwards from the beginning. So working forwards from the beginning, here's how I approach any geometry question. I look at the information they've given me and I say, what can I work out from that information? So they've given me that this is 40 degrees. Why? Why have they given that to me? What can I do? The reason this works is because they have to give you a starting point, which means there has to be something you can work out with 40 degrees in order to get closer to your answer over here. And the answer to that is this angle here is also 40 degrees because of alternate segment theorem. If you remember what a segment is, a segment is kind of like this uh, slice of the circle over here. Because these are in two different segments, because as you can see, there's two segments here, right? There's C, A, B. In fact, let me draw it on for you. This is one segment. And this is the other segment. And they share this line over here. Because they're in two different segments, they are equal. That's what the alternate segment means. So let's get rid of that now because we don't need it. Okay, now I know that, what can I do with that? Well, then they've told me this whole thing about x and 3x. That means that this, these angles are divided into a ratio, right? Where this side, the green angle, gets one out of four, a quarter of that angle there. So that'd be 10 degrees. And the red part must be 30 degrees. Okay. By the way, so far, this is a four mark question. We've got two marks. I haven't done anything too crazy yet, have I, really? Now, spotting the next thing is a little bit tricky, but this is worth thinking any time you have a circle theorem question. If you notice, we have a line going from O to A and O to B. Now, both of those are going to be the radius of the circle. That means that this is an isosceles triangle, which means this angle over here is also 30 degrees. And again, you can say base angles in an isosceles triangle are equal for the other reason. Because bear in mind, you need the correct answer and you need at least one correct circle theorem. So I've already given that one, so I'm actually done now. Okay, so what can I work out now I know those two angles? Well, now I know two angles in a triangle. The first thing I can work out is the third angle in the triangle, right? Logically. So that would be 30 plus 30 is 60. 180 minus 60 is 120 degrees. So can you see how as soon as I've worked out something, 
I think, what else can I work out? And I'm taking these little steps, step by step. And now lastly, but certainly not least, I can actually work out the red part of this angle here. Why? Because if we have a look at this red angle and this blue angle, they are both made from the same two points on the circumference. You see that? We have O to A. So if I draw it out for you. both made from points on the circumference. That means we can use the fact that angles at the centre are twice that at the circumference to say that this is actually 60 degrees. And that means the total black angle, the angle ACD, is just 60 plus 40, 100 degrees. So again, that is, that's probably the easiest way to do it where you take the information they've given you and you work something out and then you, with that information what can you work out and you take these steps, okay? Again, it's hard for me to give you a general process that you need to follow, you know, do this, then do this, then do this. Instead, it's what information they've given you and what can you work out using that information. This is actually a fairly tricky probability question because laying this information out is quite hard. Doing a probability tree is not really feasible. I mean, there is a way to do it, but in my opinion, when I drew this out just now, it looks a bit more complicated than it's worth. So here we have semi-finals of a chess tournament. A plays B and C plays D. Then the winners will play each other. And they give you all of this information here. I would actually ignore this information for now. But it says, work out the probability that A will win the tournament. So how can A win the tournament? Well, the first thing that has to happen is A has to beat against B. That's the beat against B, that doesn't make any sense. A wins against B. Then there's two possibilities, right? Either A plays against C, or A plays against D. Now, the reason why this is a bit complicated is that for C to like be able to play in any, like, at all, is C has to win against D. So here we have the probability that A wins against B, which is 0 0.6, times the probability that C wins against D originally, which is C wins against D is 0 0.2, and then the probability that A actually beats C. That makes sense? Then we have A wins against B, but then we have D wins against C, and then A wins against D. So A wins against B is again 0 0.6. Then the probability that D wins against C, well, if the probability that C wins against D is 0 0.2, then the probability that D wins against C would be 0 0.8. And then the probability that A wins against D is 0 0.3. So those are the two combinations that can work, right? But hopefully you can see why this is a little bit tricky because there's technically a hidden probability tree under here but if we multiply all of this together we should get the right answer so we have 0 0.6 times 0 0.2 is 0 0.12 times 0 0.5 would be 0 0.06 then here uh, let's do 0 0.6 times 0 0.8 is 0 0.48 and then times 0 0.3 which would give me Yep, and then that means since either of those combinations will work, the probability that they will win is just adding those two together. So the reason why I really wanted to do this question is because a lot of students will rely on Venn diagrams, two-way tables or probability trees to get the answer, but sometimes it is faster to do it in your head and think about each combination individually. But not just that, sometimes it's necessary. Like in this case, drawing the tree would be horrendous because you have two trees that then intertwine with each other, right? Which is odd. Or you have like nested trees, which, um, yeah, I don't, I don't like that very much. So hopefully that kind of explains it a little bit better. And for the final question, once again, we have an equation of a tangent, which students find fairly tricky because they change it up every single year. So, I mean, I always like to draw a diagram. You know me, right? 
And again, if you if you guys are planning on doing A level maths, diagrams are going to be your absolute savior. Look at that perfect circle. <laughs> the computer didn't even recognize it as a circle. Thanks. All right, and then we have some point P one. Now, when it says find an equation for the tangent, it, this is actually just a y equals mx plus c question, which is technically grade four, five, grade five. So we need two things. We need a gradient and we need a y-intercept. So we need a gradient and we need a coordinate. Now our coordinate is p and 1, so we don't actually have a full coordinate yet, but this point, p1, has to also be on the circle itself. Right? Because a tangent has to actually touch the circle. So what that means is if I sub in p and 1 into the equation for a circle, which we know everything for, I can work out what the x-coordinate is. So let's do that. We have p squared plus 1 squared equals 4. So p squared, 1 is squared is just 1, equals 3. So p is equal to square root 3. Um, technically plus minus, but let's leave it. It's fine. Square root 3. There we go. So from here, how do you work out the equation of a tangent? So honestly, Again, although this is a grade 9 topic, I don't find it too bad because A, it's y equals mx plus c, and B, there's only one trick after this, which is that the radius and the tangent are perpendicular. So you work out the gradient of the radius and then negative reciprocal it. But even that's not too bad because the radius starts at 0, 0, so the gradient is going to be 1 minus 0 over root 3 minus 0. So it's always just the y coordinate divided by the x coordinate. So again, I find that to be somewhat nice, which means the gradient of our tangent is going to be the negative reciprocal, so it's going to be minus root 3 over 1, so minus root 3. So, so far we have y equals minus root 3 x plus c. Then we can just sub in the coordinate to find the value plus c, and it says give your answers y plus root 8, Wait, yeah, whatever, cool. So, uh, y is 1, x is root 3. Now root 3 times root 3 is just 3, so that's minus 3 plus c, so c equals 4. So your answer is, well actually, I'm, I'm going to check myself there, <clears throat> because our answer has to be in this form. If I left it like this, I'd only get 3 out of 4. So please, please, please make sure when you sit in that exam, you're checking what the question's asking you for. So all they want me to do is move the x over to the other side, that's it. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, that's stupid. It's like, well, yeah, but that's what they're asking you for, right? Um, so, yeah, that's it for the paper. So hopefully you found that fairly useful, maybe even enjoyable, dare I say. If you did, then please do consider subscribing as it does help me out. But I'll leave you to a revision. Best of luck, and I'll see you in the next one.